Hello and welcome to the Raw Podcast brought to you by the Sunderland <coughs> Echo. My name is James Copley. I'm joined by my mate Phil Smith. Phil, how are you doing? You're on mute before you start. There we go. Yeah, it's just because I was coughing while you were doing your intro. So I that <laughs> won't be a very good start to put. I'm ever, right. the, ever the professional. Ever the professional. <laughs> um, well, we haven't done a podcast for a while. It's been the international break, which is as boring for us as it is for you. Uh, we're going to sort of whiz through a couple of talking points today. But one thing that me and Phil wanted to discuss really was Sunderland's sort of start to the season, 11 games played, um, heading into the international break. Sitting fourth at the moment, Phil, above Leeds United, but behind Preston, Ipswich and Leicester City. Um, I think had you offered Sunderland fans that at the start of the season, most would have taken it. Obviously, that there have been a few little blips there and a few little issues along the way. But um, on the whole, a fairly... Optimistic start by Sunderland with the caveat of a lot of the new signings haven't really bedded in properly yet. We haven't seen the best of Burstow. We haven't seen Mayanda yet. Um, we certainly haven't seen the best of um, of Royson or Semedo, Lewis Amir Semedo. So there's a lot to go at at the moment. Yeah, I think so. And I think obviously it, it, it's skewed by the fact that the last game was a 4 0 defeat, right? Which was really disappointing. Um, but, you know, it had you sort of pulled some of the fans before that Middlesbrough game off the back of the Watford win, I think it would have been really, really optimistic. And I think rightly so. I think ultimately, you know, you start the season with two defeats off the back of what had been, I think was a challenge in summer in terms of, I'm sure the club would say, you know, they they had a plan and knew what they were doing, but because of the speculation around, you know, Danny Bart, Lyndon Gooch, um, Alex Pritchard, um, because of the sort of length of time it took to sort of reinforce the striking options. You know, when when we sat after the Preston game, it felt a bit unsettled, isn't it, as a club? And, and I think there was a lot of concern about whether Sunderland were able, going to be able to kick on as a team and be stronger than they were last year when you consider that Ahmad had gone back to Man United. At this stage, we didn't know Ross Stewart was going to leave, but we knew it was a possibility. And I think, to be fair to Tony Mowbray, he was really strong after that Preston game. I was thinking about this the other day. You know, not just putting a brave face on it, saying, you know what, these two performances we've produced, we've lost both games, but they're pretty good. And if we can sort of stay at this level, we're going to be all right. And obviously that has been totally vindicated, as you say, with a few blips along the way. Cardiff's probably the one that sticks in the throat the most because it was a game that someone shouldn't have lost. You know, the middles per game was a mess, but sometimes you do get someone sent off and lose a game. You know, you do see that. So I think the Cardiff's the one that feels like the biggest missed opportunity. But I think the team for me, has looked better this year. Um, that doesn't mean to say they'll finish higher or they'll get in the playoffs again. But you have to put it in context last season that you had a genius in Ahmad. You had a really weak field, which is why you were able to get into the playoffs with a points tally that normally never would get you into the playoffs. And even though he missed most of the season, Ross Stewart scored in basically every game he did play in. Mm. Um, I actually think all around the team's better this year. And you know, I did a, a column last week that people can still go and read if they want to looking at obviously you know we have a bit of access to some sort of performance data through Y Scout and Sunderland's performance data bears that out they are much better they are much more of a consistent attacking threat this season um, without getting any worse defensively so that would suggest that they are a good um, they are in a pretty good place so I, I by and large I think the football has been even better to watch I think the team's looked even better all around the question of whether they're going to replicate or better what they did last year, for me, is less about Sunderland, actually, and more about the other teams. So, Leicester look mm. pretty much clear at the moment, don't they? Ipswich, mm. whether they'll sustain their form now, I don't know, but they certainly won't drop off massively. Leeds are starting to look really strong. They had a horrible summer, didn't they, in terms of transfer speculation what have you, but they've got a good manager and seem to have things sort of a lot more under control now. So, the question for me isn't as much about Sunderland in terms of where they'll finish. Um, I think this is a better team than last year and I think it'll end up with more points if they can continue um, on the track that they're on. So, all in all, I think it's been a very good start of the season, although it feels a little silly saying that when you've just been beaten 4-0 by, by your local rivals. Um, but yeah, I think it's hard not to be encouraged. key question, which you've alluded to, is whether these players are going to come in, Reese in, um, will we see more of Aushish? Um, you know, mm -hmm. will these players add to what's already there? Because if so, then it is pretty exciting. Um, and I think that's going to be a key question moving forward: is is the squad really going to get stronger? Um, 
that's that's going to be really interesting to watch unfold. I guess the hope is, Phil, that one of the players that we've sort of mentioned, one of the new arrivals, or maybe one of the existing squad in their own way, can maybe not to the, the extent of a mad, because as you mentioned, he was a little genius, but it did take him until December, thinking, thinking back to, yeah. to get fully up to speed. Well, and I guess the hope before, is somebody can emerge as a breakout star. A mad scored that incredible goal um, against Birmingham, didn't he? Just yeah. before the World Cup break. And that was almost the moment at which from which he never looked back. I think it's a really interesting question. Maybe Ahmad's not the best example just because he was so good. Maybe a, a really good example is Mishu, right? Mm-hmm. Who Mishu, we barely saw kick a ball up until after the World Cup break. I know someone eventually didn't sign him, but actually Mishu was a big squad player in that second half of the season, pretty much from the new year onwards. You know, played a lot of football, made some contributions. If you think back to that West Brom away win, which was just an incredible day, Mishu had a brilliant well, there was, game that day. There, were, there was times we discussed on this podcast, and it, the, the narrative was, "Oh, well, we'll be signing Mishu." Well, yeah, that yeah, was, absolutely. That was right? just, yeah. That was, we, yeah, we all yeah. thought that was going to happen because he'd been so good. Yeah, and I think that's probably. I think that's the example for me where I look at can can two or three of these guys go on to be a Mishu? Um, Aushish to me, I think has got a big chance. I've been so impressed with him. I think he looks like such an intelligent footballer you always kind of can see a good player because they don't need that much time to settle. They're just instantly on a wavelength with the other good players. Yeah, and yeah. even though Aushish and Pritchard had probably said about 10 words to each other, <laughs> as soon as they started playing, they're just bouncing off each other. Um, and I know as well that Aushish is he's more experienced. He's played, you know, 70 odd league on games, isn't it? Um, and he's also, his English is pretty good, which is massive for him. So I think that's helped him really settle. Um, so uh, yeah, Aushish is definitely one, and then can somebody like a, you know a Mienda or a Rusin, um, Rusin's experience, I said, guess would make him the most likely. But if one or two of those players can do what Mishu did, um, when you bring Bradley Dak into the fold as well, you feel like the options are there to be pretty consistently a big attacking threat. Um, and that yeah, I, I'm 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 pretty I'm I'm pretty optimistic at the moment. I think Sunderland are in a good place. You know, mm. so if you were to say what was my main concern, you know, obviously there's a little bits with Sunderland. So like that second half against Middlesbrough massively showed the experience in midfield that we've talked about loads. Like, yeah, yeah. you know, half time. I know Mowbray got a bit of criticism for the second half, which was fair because it was really bad. But like, you know, the the midfield was Clark, Aushish, Job, and Roberts. Mm. Like, that is not where you want to be with 10 men against a really good attack no. side. So there's, there's no think, hold, there's no holding midfield there. No, there? and yeah, exactly. Um so yeah, I think like yeah, so I, I I don't think I think there are one or two sort of issues with this squad, but generally I think some of the really good players. My bigger thing is like, yeah, I don't see Leicester dropping off. I think Ipswich might drop off a bit, but not massively. I think Leeds are going to come on really strong. It's more about the strength of the division than any Major concerns I have with the strength of Sunderland, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. That that sort of column I wrote that I referred to, that really sort of confirmed what I felt I was seeing, which was that a team that might not quite have as much stardust as it did last year at times, but actually is is structurally better than it was. Yeah, um, yeah. I, th- I think as as well, what we've mentioned the new arrivals there because you know they're a talking point, they're exciting, and we haven't necessarily seen the best of them, but it's worth noting as well that the likes of Anthony Patterson, Dan Ballard, Dennis Sergan, Trey Hume, they're all a year more experienced now, and I think it's beginning to show. And then somebody who is starting to find his feet and who looks like it could be a real asset, somebody like Nal Huggins coming to the fore, I think is hugely yeah. exciting as well for the option he gives. He comes with great pedigree, um, and it's great to see him sort of return from injury. I mean, Luke O9 has, has stepped up marvellous, marvellously at I think I know, I know with a caveat, with caveat and everything in this podcast, we've just beaten, uh, been beaten by Middlesbrough five nil. But you know, you you mentioned Weisgat. If you if you look at Luke O'Nine's stats in terms of what he's in that defensive unit to do, which is to bring the ball out and to pass it, his stats are off the chart. Where he does fall down slightly is perhaps his aerial duels aren't as good as as other central defenders. But at the end of the day, that's what he's in the side to do. And, and I do feel. I, I didn't really get it at the, at the beginning, to be honest, the the sort of annexing of Danny Barth and, and moving him on to change Sunderland's playing style. But having watched it and having seen, for instance, the five of them against Southampton, I do understand what they're trying to do now. Um, and if they do want to go down that road, I think with the type of player Sunderland have, it could potentially be quite worthwhile in terms of the style and results yeah. in the future. Yeah, I, I think what we've seen, right, is that 
that issue was, and we talked about this a lot of the time, we've seen that that decision and that process had a lot of layers to it. So mm. it wasn't as simple as, you know, financial or anything like that. The team was clearly moving in a certain direction and that, that then left everyone with a decision. The key to that is not so much now. I think Mowbray has been absolutely vindicated in that decision. The issue is going to be an injury or suspension, isn't it, right? Because I think what most Summer yeah. fans would say is, well, if you get an injury or a suspension, what an incredible scenario in where you've got Danny Barter come in mm-hmm. um, and, ever, and you know you know what you're going to get. And that's a totally fair comment. Sunderland's response, as we've talked about loads on this pod, would be, especially at that stage of the career, you can't just expect players to sit around waiting, hoping that they might get the odd game four months down the line. If they, you, know, the, you just can't expect players to do that. And we're going to go back and forth with that debate for the whole time this policy is in place. And sometimes it'll seem like a good idea, sometimes not so good. Um, but yeah, I think the point I was going to make was that one of the big debates we had in the summer and the point you make about players like Dan Neal, Dan Ballard, I think is a massively pertinent one because when there was that discussion about experience and leadership in the squad, one of the things that, was, that the club would say to counter the view that they were going too young and too inexperienced would be, well, one, age and experience are two different things. Mm-hmm. You can have a really ex- inexperienced 23-year-old and a really experienced 20-year-old. Mm-hmm. And also that when we talk about developing players, growing assets, um, creating footballers that other clubs want to buy or who you can take up levels with you, is that it's not just about their on-pitch growth, it's about their off-pitch growth as well. And they would say that what they really wanted to do this year, and part of it was giving these players a new contract, they wanted Dan Neal to step up as one of the key leaders in the group. They wanted to give Dan Ballard increased leadership experience and give him that role in the team. It's not just about developing these guys as technical players. It's about developing them as footballers. And obviously the off-pitch stuff and the sort of leadership stuff is a big part of that. Um, that is a risk, obviously, but I think so far it's working out pretty well. I mean, Ballard, Neil, um, they've been so good this year. You know, mm-hmm. they have been, and we're not just talking like, oh, these young players look promising. When I say they've been so good this year, I mean, they are getting into, I think, pretty much any championship side. Um, that's yeah. the level that they're at every single week. So, um, yeah, yeah. As we've discussed a little bit, there are definitely like talking points that we're going to come back to a lot over the season. And maybe in a sticky patch, we'll be less enthusiastic about some of those decisions that have been taken than we are just now. Um, but I, what I think what I think it's fair to say is I, I don't think I'm being sort of overly optimistic or positive for the sake of it in saying this. I think 11 games in, right? I think we can understand the decisions that were taken in the summer. Yeah. So yeah. we might not, we still might not agree with him. We still might think it was too much of a gamble. Um, mm-hmm. You know, certainly, as we've said repeatedly, both of us would have liked to have seen an experienced hold midfield come in. And I still, you know, we would still say that now, I think. Um, mm-hmm. But generally speaking, I think you can now, when you watch the team, you can understand why certain decisions were sort of made in the summer. Absolutely. Well, we'll probably come back to a lot of those debates, as you mentioned, over the coming weeks and months. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Stoke City, Phil, who we play on Saturday away from home. Just check on the championship table, just to double check that what I had in my notes was correct, because it is actually a little hard to believe at times that Stoke City are currently 21st in the championship. They've got 10 points from 11 games. They've lost seven, won three, um, of course, under Alex Neil, former Sundland boss. We're seeing... Every time we look at Stoke, they don't seem to be doing too well. They had a sort of little resurgence towards the back end of the last championship season. From what I've seen, Stoke City fans aren't too impressed. You can understand why. I would love to to maybe speak to, I think it's Pete Smith down there who who writes covering Stoke City and get his views at some point. In fact, I'm sure John Nicholson will do that, but it doesn't really look like a, a happy camp from the outside looking in. And a bit of surprise probably shared for the both of us, actually, that Alex Neil hasn't been able to to turn that round as he may have liked. Um, he's yeah. certainly been backed. He's certainly, you know, his, his staff are now in place. His, his the, well, a, a few of his players are in there. Obviously, Lyndon Gooch has gone there. It's um, it's a bit of a perplexing one, really, from an out- outsider's perspective, why they haven't managed to to kick on. Yeah, I think, um, no, it, it is perplexing. I think that, in terms of this season, I think the first caveat you would have to say is that um, they have had a lot of injuries um, and, you know, we know as well as any other club how destabilising that can be. I think the other aspect of that, obviously, is they had a huge summer mm. sort of recruitment drive and completely overhauled the squad. Um, now, I think that the, the problem is, is that Alex Neil isn't going to get sort of grace for that, I don't think, because that was led by him. 
if that yeah, makes yeah. sense. So um, if the issue is is that the squad's not quite coming together or not quite clicking, then I, I imagine that he's sort of being judged negatively because he's so closely associated with those decisions. Strange, isn't it? Because obviously that game up at the Stadium Light, sort of in March, I think it was, um, or where, whenever it was, um, I think that really actually galvanised them because I mm. think the intensity around the game and the, yeah, I think that actually really worked for Stoke. And, you know, they were able to play that sort of counter-attacking style, soak up the pressure, use the atmosphere. And I think it was probably a really good game for Alex Neal, weirdly, in a way. Because um, they were, you know, struggling. I thought they'd be loads better this season. Um, I, I, did. I I thought they'd be loads better last season. Um, really hard to sort of put your finger on it. But again, it might be a good game at a good time for Alex Neal. You know, he might feel... Um, I think you're always a little bit nervous, aren't you? Because... When we watched Alex Neal at Sunderland, I would feel pretty quietly optimistic when you were coming up against a side who have a certain kind of playing identity, who want the ball. Yeah. Um, and we're massively in favour. We love watching it, don't we? And we don't want it to change. And we absolutely love what Tony Mowbray does. Um, very, very, very pleased to see someone become associated with such an attractive playing style. Alex Neal does tend to thrive generally on picking it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, know, under, uh, under under Alex Neal, that you you would turn up and you think, right, we're going to exploit a team's weakness here. Yeah, there's something almost um, Mourinho esque about him in a kind of way. Do you know what I mean? He mm. seems to relish, um, probably doesn't mind being the pan of Van Millen. Yeah, certainly, certainly, is, certainly his press conferences. <laughs> yeah, certainly loves the idea of you know oh, this team gets loads of praise for the way we play. You know, we'll pick them off. You know, and. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think maybe Neil and Stoke will feel it's a good game for them at a good time. But um, the key question for both teams and one of the interesting things over the next few days is going to be the injury list, right? Because mm-hmm. at the moment, you're looking at it thinking Sunderland could potentially be much stronger this weekend, which I'm sure we'll go into in a little bit. i uh, say so Stoke have got six or seven, including Lyndon Gooch, first-team players who've had injury issues over recent weeks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If, they're, if they've cleared over the international break, maybe we'll see a bit more of what we expected from Stoke this year. Um, if not, then you know it, it's going to be difficult for them, isn't it? So it's going to be a really interesting game. We'll touch we'll touch on the, the injuries um, shortly, but you mentioned that being an interesting fixture. There's loads of narratives. But given where Stoke are, where they are in the Championship, there could be, and I'm, I'm slightly thrown up forward a bit here, and I'm not you know, hoping for this, I'm not trying to talk them out of a job or anything, but it could be, could be that Sunderland defeats Stoke City pretty handily and Alex Neal is out of a job. It, th- there is the potential for that sort yeah. of quite I think, seismic narrative. I, I think at this point, I think Stoke have invested so heavily, not just in Alex Neal, but in every aspect of what he wants to do. I just don't think they can make that decision. And they've, um, only, they've only just got his, his preferred backroom stuff in place as well. Yeah, exactly. And... You know, he is, his fingerprints are all over this squad overhaul, all over the team. You know, their technical director there is someone who Neil worked with at Norwich. So I doubt it's the kind of relationship that we have at Sunderland where the sporting director clearly has the upper hand. Mm. Um, mm. I think I strongly suspect it's the other way around. So I just think that, you know, I think Stoke have reached a point where they have to just back a manager over a long period of time. Um you know, but fan, I fan think, pressure, fan pressure is a funny thing. I, I think, I think their ownership though are probably strong enough to withstand that. I think up to a certain point, you're right in what yeah. you say. This is the thing about the championship though. Like you know, I mean, how many points are behind uh, behind Sunderland are stuck? Eight, nine. Uh, I will look for you now. Sunderland are on nineteen points. Points, sorry, and Stoke are on ten. So yeah, nine points. Yeah, so it's still it's still one of those divisions where you know it can change so quickly, um, and yeah. and and maybe as players come back up. We'll start to get on a little bit of a roll, but I think it'll be a really good game. Actually, I'm looking forward to it. Clash of styles. Um, there'll be a bit plenty of heat around the game. Plenty. I think it's going to be a really enjoyable game. Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope for a sudden victory. What is the latest on injuries, Phil? Because Dan Ballard is off with Northern Ireland. He played 90 minutes against San Marino, um, but did pick up a knock. He, I think Michael O'Neill said he woke up quite sore, so he looks a doubt for their next fixture. Um, what's the general situation with other players as well? Because obviously PR Equal was was out for a little while, and we're still waiting on um, players like Aji Alisi. What's the picture at the moment? Yeah, we'll we'll know a little bit bit better later in the week. But as, as it stands, um, Pritchard, Echo, and Dak have been back training. Um, 
which and I think they're the three who you could expect to see come pretty much straight back into the squad straight away. None of them had particularly major injuries. Um, they're players who maybe in certain circumstances could have been pushed just before the international break. Mm-hmm. I think someone didn't feel it was worth the risk, you know, and potentially getting a worse injury. So I think the plan was always that they would come straight back in at the break. And the fact that they've been trained and suggests that they'll be able to do that. So, I mean, Equa has to come straight back to the team if he's fit, doesn't he? Because of Neil's suspension. And that may well mean that Pritchard comes back in as well. And you have Equa, Job and Pritchard as your three. I think that's pretty likely at this point. Um, Elise is back in full training, which obviously is a huge boost because he was an amazing player last year. Had an incredible yeah. first season. Versatile as well. Yeah, and I think he'll be back on the bench pretty quickly for exactly that reason. He can play left back, he can play centre back, he can play left of the back three. I wouldn't be surprised if he was in the squad this Saturday or certainly one of the two games after it. But I don't think we'll see him play much. I think he'll play potentially two or three under 21s games before he starts for Sunderland, just because it's actually been, if you think, I know he came back from the Luton game, but he's essentially had three months out either side of that. So he's barely played football for six months. So that's going to be a long term process. And I think Meander's in a similar category. I'd be surprised if we saw Meander in the squad this week, just because Mobit does have a lot of options when you add Rusin, Oshish. Um, there's no need to. Obviously. There's no need to rush him back with him being such a long term project as no, well. No, there isn't. So again, I think Meander's really, really close in terms of. I think we'll see him in the twenty ones really soon, and that's mm. hugely exciting. Um, so yeah, I think there will definitely be players back. An interesting one is Dennis Serkin, who. We have seen pictured in training um, over the international break, but Mowbray was pretty clear before the international break that he thought Serkin would be a little bit longer. Um, so it may well be that he's not fully fit for the weekend, but he's clearly not far off. Um, and we'll wait and see on Huggins. Initial hope was that there wasn't a serious injury um, and that it was more just kind of precautionary given his injury record. Um, but we'll wait for an official update on that. But that seemed to be fairly encouraging noises. Um, mm-hmm. so let's hope that's the case excellent I think, well, that's move... everyone. I think that is yeah you did a marvellous job there Phil brilliant brilliant um, uh, Pembele, so... Pembele obviously but we knew you know he's yeah. still going to be a while and he'll have to pay a fair bit from the 21s as well yeah yeah well I can't believe I'm saying this in October but we're going to have a little look at a couple of um, very minor transfer stories uh, the Jan... no, sorry the summer transfer window's only just shut in my mind but here we are hurtling towards January again and I suppose the fun starts to begin again, um, which is interesting. But the first one was um, Jan Imvir. Uh, there's been some noises about him potentially coming back to Sunderland. There might have been a conversation in the in the summer with Kirill Louis Dreyfus. Um, it's a story that always catches the eyes of, of Sunderland fans because he was so magnificent for for that twelve months that he spent at the club. For me, though, Phil, I don't know about you. It just struck me as a um, player and agent maybe trying to resurfaced name ahead of potential move at some point. Um that that's that's how it looked to me. But I mean I'd be massively yeah. in favour if there was a possibility. Yeah. L- listen, I think so. I, I know I I can only give you the insight from you know sort of stuff from knowing how Sunland work. And I know that the first thing that happens when the transfer window closes is that Sunland both through that traditional scouting and through that data sort of filters the first thing they do is look at the free agents after the mm. transfer window closes. Um, we knew that central midfield was an area where um, they were potentially light, so they will have done a check. Um, and then I spoke to Christian Speakman about a week later and asked if they were going to sign a free agent central mm. midfielder, and he said absolutely not, mm-hmm. um, and that they'd done that check. MV was a free agent at that time, so it would be strange if that has you know, completely changed six weeks down the line. Um it would be it it would is, obviously be kind of amazing, but also kind would, of he would I would imagine command the pretty his wages, wage. yeah. His it wages would, it would, would take him at least six weeks to get up to fitness, by which point it's nearly January anyway. So I would say I would say take that with it. I don't want to say I feel like we should all enjoy these silly transfer rooms because it's great. <laughs> um and you know, obviously I have a different view of them now that uh, it's like my job, but obviously I remember how much I loved stuff like that. So back in the day. So yeah, we should all get aboard the Jan bus um, for a little bit, but obviously it probably won't happen um, <laughs> because for, for, for many, many, many reasons. But hey, listen, I think we would both say that if there was an opportunity to sign a fit, experienced, good holding midfielder, you know, yeah. that we'd hope that Sunderland were at least exploring it because um, I, I do think it's a big squad now, so I have to be careful just saying they need to sign loads more players, but I think the second half of the middle is 
you know, did show that maybe there would be a, a space. It's that specialist role, isn't it? Which we've ar- arg- so. arg- arguably needed since Dan Neal started filling in for Corey Evans and, last season. Yeah, and listen, to be fair, they haven't really played with an out-and-out holder midfielder this year. Neil and Necker have kind of shared it. And to be fair, that's worked really well. Oh, um, yeah, even, yeah. Neil, even Neil and Job, to an extent, when they've shared it, it's worked really well. So I think we have to say that as a caveat. It's just that in certain stand, certain circumstances, you're just watching the team and you just feel it's like yeah. crying out for it. So, um, yeah, I, I think that position is going to be an interesting one going into January. Um, see where Jamie Tet is at at that stage. I forgot all about realistic. him, you know. And now, and, I forgot and again, all about he, isn't, he, he isn't a holding midfielder. Mm. At all, not by any stretch of the imagination. That's not his best position. But if you are doing this slightly half and half thing, which someone's doing now, maybe Matete could do that. You know, he could definitely play the role that Neil Neckwa are playing at the moment. Um, so if that's the case, then I think Matete definitely could be the answer. And you know, what's the point in bringing someone else in when you've got a talented young player who needs opportunities? So, um, yeah, it, it's an interesting position, but I do still wonder if Matete could be the answer. Um, and that should be the answer, you know. That's what Sunderland, Sunderland should be trying to do, and um, when he's fit. So yeah, yeah. The other little um, transfer tidbit and insane headline to write, actually, uh, given Sunderland's re- recent sort you know, of history of being in the doldrums of, of League One, and you know, concentrating with all due respect on players like Callum McFadden and Josh Scone. But uh, apparently, Real Madrid, that um, little old club in Spain. Um, had sent a scout to watch Joe Bellingham. Obviously, Jude Bellingham doing pretty well in La Liga at the moment and the Champions League with uh, with Real Madrid. It's one of those, isn't it, Phil, where I guess there's a lot of scouts probably overwatching Joe Bellingham, given his, his pedigree and whatnot. And he, he, by all accounts, played excellently for England's under-19s against Montenegro. Um, so, yeah, a compliment, probably not something to get our knickers too much in a twist about, but He's a very good football player, and he's he's the right age, he's the right profile, he's the right size, he's got strength, he's got talent, he's got pedigree. Um, so it's sort of expected in a way, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think there'll be loads of players that big teams are scouting at Sunderland. Um, not anything to get overly concerned about, I don't think. Um, I think we all know when somebody like Joe Bellingham comes to Sunderland, it's for the opportunity to play, um, and the sort of basic idea is that he either goes to the Premier League with Sunderland and that's amazing, or if he sort of grows a little bit quicker than Sunderland do, he can go for a huge fee and that money can be reinvested to help Sunderland get to the Premier League behind him. So I think that's just, can feel a little sort of, um, nobody wants your club to be like a selling club or whatever. So it can feel like not a nice sort of thing, I guess, but um, Joe already is worth a lot more than someone paid for him um, 11 games in. So where's he going to be in a year or two? You know, it's it's scary to think about. So I think it's just a, it's just going to be a bit of a change, I think, following Sunderland over the next couple of years. It's not something that we've had a lot of in recent past, which is mm. a lot of outgoing transfer speculation, players you know being wanted by other clubs. Well, the, the pattern has always been who are we going to get and who is out of contract and is going to leave. Yeah. That, that's the pattern, yeah. isn't it? Um, and I think what hopefully what we saw with the Clark Burnley thing in the summer is that yes, players are going to go, but it's not a really straightforward thing at Sunderland whereby if you get a bigish offer, you just let the player go. You know, there there is the finance there to say actually, you know what? No, you need to bid a, a huge amount. Um, it's not just a case of oh, we can turn a profit on this player, so let's so that you know it's time for them to go. Um, so I think we can take a little bit of reassurance from the Clark whenever we see stories like this. Um, we can take a bit of reassurance from from the sort of Clark scenario. Job, who signed, long, I think it was a four year deal when he arrived. You know, we can certainly take a lot of confidence from that. Certain scenarios are slightly different. So the Ross Stewart one, because of the contractual situation, I suppose. Earlier this summer, when Southampton came in for Pat Roberts, that was a similar kind of scenario. But with a lot of these young players who suddenly have got on long term contracts, I think just enjoy the journey, really. Um, because the only way they leave is in a way that is financially incredibly beneficial to Sunderland. Mm. Um, and so, yes, while it will be sad, um, the team will move on. Um, so I think for the most part, don't don't worry about these things. Um, yeah. And, and know, for what he's, the, in the, he's in the first three months of his Sunderland career, so it's not, you know, it's, yeah. it is a, a case of literally just enjoy him. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. 
Um, and like I say, you know, with with all these younger players, especially, um, their departure means that they are doing, they have attracted a huge bid. And although it's never nice to see players leave, um, and in fairness to Sunderland, even in a scenario where they didn't have that contractual security with Ross Stewart, they still got what I think everyone would say was a really good fee. Um, mm. That's not to say it was this wasn't disappointing or that you know because it was disappointing, but I think we've got enough evidence now to know that they're not going to be pushed over. Um, so that allows us, I think, to be fairly calm about these things as and when they come around, which they which they will keep doing, I'm sure. Absolutely. Well, that probably brings an end to the Raw podcast. Um, you can follow all the build-up to Stoke City away on Saturday over at the Sunderland Echo website. I think Joe might have a preview podcast as well, but we'll have all of the latest from Tony Mobile's press conference as well, I think, on Thursday, is it, Phil? Yeah, yeah. And Excellent. we will do it. We will have to do a, a, a special on on some of the women's season so far next week oh, yes, as well. Let's make it. Yeah, yeah let's, let's, do make, that. let's make a commitment to do that next week because it's a it's an incredible story. What's there? What's unfolding yeah. there? So and of course, let's um, do that. We'll, we'll have to speak about Kira Ramshaw as well, who's um, who deserves a podcast of her own because she's uh, hung up her boots at age twenty nine. Brilliant servant, brilliant player. But we, yeah, we'll get to that. Absolutely. Well, let's do it. Let's let's do a special next week. Let's do that. That'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. Happy days. Right. Cool. So yes, yeah, Sunday night for all of the latest uh, news and updates ahead of Stoke City and keep an eye out next week for a special podcast on Sunderland women. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>